everyone. Welcome to Make Moments Matter, a music education podcast, where I share lesson ideas, songs, games, and inspiring things for your elementary music classroom. My name is David Rao, and I am the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. This episode of the podcast is a replay containing the audio version of a Musical Mondays live video. If you're not familiar with Musical Mondays, every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, I go live on Facebook and Instagram to share about the lessons that I'm using in class with my students. I give a recap of my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons and then do a deep dive about one grade level and share the books, instruments, songs, and process that I use to teach the lesson to kids. This podcast episode contains all the audio from the Musical Mondays video, but if you'd like to see a replay of the video itself, you can find a link to the archived video on YouTube when you click the link in the notes for this episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. Here's the show. Hey everyone, my name is David Rao, and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, Pinterest, and a variety of other places when you search for my name, David Rao, or Make Moments Matter. Um, I'm excited to be sharing tonight. It's the last Musical Mondays of the school year, believe it or not. And um, tonight I'm going to be answering so many of the questions that you all sent in in the last week. Um, So it's sort of like a let's hang out and chit chat and talk about classroom because when does that ever going to happen for us? Um, And so if you have a question that you're like, oh, rats, this was a question, I uh, put it in the chat and I'll try and get to it. Um, I'll try and get to as many of the questions that people send in as I can. And maybe guess what? Your question might get answered in there. There's a lot about classroom management. (laughs) It's a lot about... um, Uh, special learners. There's some really great questions that y'all send in. So I'm going to try and get to all those. But if you have a question tonight, toss that in the chat and I'll try and get to that. Um, So that's what's coming up. A couple quick things. If you hear me talk about a book or a resource, or if I mention a website or something else, um, there's a whole page on my blog dedicated to the links that I talk about in these videos. So if you go to makemomentsmatter.org and click the video tab, you can find the links page for this school current school year. Or if you, wherever you're watching or listening, um, I'm going to be Uh, There should be a caption at the bottom of the video or in the Instagram link and profile where you can go straight to um, that links page. Uh, Another place you can connect, um, there's a Facebook group, Every Moment Matters Music Education Community. You can join in and ask questions and find uh, great answers there. So if you don't get an answer, don't hear your question tonight or you don't get a chance to ask your question, go join that Facebook group, ask your question, and we'll find a, a way to connect there. Um, okay, <laughs> I've already seen a couple of people asking. So just really quickly, um, I know this is a music ed uh, video slash podcast, but <laughs> it's also, ooh, now you can check out the <laughs> it's a fashion podcast. No, um, so my shirt, if you're listening to the podcast and can't see it, um, it says Clara, Fanny, Hildegard, Nadia, Lily, and Florence. This is from the amazing Dynamic Doodles. Uh, sorry, Dynamic Doodle Company. You can find them on Instagram. I linked them on the links page. Uh, this is just one of the amazing shirts of theirs that I have. They also made uh, these super cool buttons that I have with composer faces and these super cute little cartoons. Um, they make some amazing stuff. I could pull out my school computer, my school computer uh, right next to my American Center for Elemental Music and, and Movement sticker and my music constructed uh, sticker is another one of their amazing stickers. So they do super cool stuff. Um, go check them out. This is just like perfect female composers, musicians, love it and super graphic and cool and perfect. So anyway, go check that out. (laughs) So I I already saw a couple of people have asked about it. So there it is. Anyway, it's on links page. You should go find it for yourself. Um, okay. So, um, this is week 15 of spring videos. That means that, uh, this year, this school year, uh, there have been 30 uh, Musical Mondays videos, and that's a lot. I've been doing this for four years, so that means there are 120 videos of Musical Mondays um, in the archive, in the podcast. Um, So if you're like, hmm, I wish I could get some like music ed content, guess what? (laughs) There are 120 videos slash hours, which feels crazy now that I'm on this side of things. But um, it's been so much fun these last four years going through and talking with people every week 
Um, and so tonight we're gonna, just going to go through and sort of try and answer as many questions as I can about things in the classroom. Um, I'm having this issue in my classroom. What do you think? Or um, you know, what's your? Where do you get links for blah blah blah? Or what do you think about this movement? Or you know, or how do you find a curriculum? There are a lot of questions that have come in. If you have a question, you don't hear it. Um, pop it in the chat. I'll try and answer as many of those as I can. But um, there are 120 videos. Go back and check them out. So anyway, that's why tonight's the last one for the spring because even though it's still April, um, I've done 30 this year and. Uh, I am lit tired, so <laughs> we're going to take a break and focus on some other things. But um, we're going to try and get to as many things as we can um, tonight. Oh, but because there have been all these videos, um, I would love if I could get some feedback. If you have feedback about um, the things that you hear in this specific video or any Musical Monday video um, or the content that I share, um, there's a quick video or a quick feedback link. I promise it'll take less than two minutes. Um, and it's super quick. It should be linked either in the video caption you're watching or on the links page or on uh, my LinkedIn profile. Um, it really does give me feedback about this was great. I love more of this. I don't want to watch any more of these. <laughs> Whatever your feedback is, um, it's really helpful to get that. So if you would be so kind after the video is over um, or whenever you're like, bye, I'm done for now, uh, to click that link and then go um, and give me some feedback. That'd be really, really helpful. And I'll make sure it's in all the captions for all of the places where you could watch or listen, but it's also in the links page. Okay, so um, there have been some great questions that have come in over the past week, and I've written them down. And sort of, uh, I'm going to try and get through as many as I can, but again, um, again, if um, you have some now, throw them in the um, throw them in the comments. I'll be trying to get to as many of those as I can. Uh, and Deborah asks. A great question already. Is your short women composers who were siblings of male composers from back in the day? Clara, Fanny, Hildegard, Nadia, Lily, Florence. Um, so I'm, I think this Nadia is Nadia Boulanger. She was not a sibling, I don't believe. Um, I mean, it's so I think Clara and Fanny, Clara was a wife. Fanny was a sister, but it's Hildegard is definitely not. Hildegard is wrong. So no, it's not just like siblings or whatever, but it's super cool. Okay. Um, so many many options on here not just relations okay first question molly asks do you ever let students pick their activities maybe as an earned reward but parameters do you give them for choosing great question no i don't <laughs> no um okay so why would you maybe do that so it I, I the reason i say no is because i don't have that sort of behavior reward system in my classroom a lot of people will have a thing like if you have a great day you can earn a four or you can get a letter or whatever or you can start a bingo card or whatever so like if the class does well they can earn towards something if i had like a, a reward day then for sure that reward day would be uh choose an activity or uh, you know, they would get to pick something in there. So if, if that were like my classroom behavior, classroom management structure, then for sure. And actually my PT, PE teacher does that where um, if they are like do super stellar that day, he'll give them a whatever and they get a color in um, a number. They get to choose a number. What I don't remember exactly how it works, but he has like a bingo card. And if they get bingo, um, then they can have a, ch a choice day. And it's basically like any of the games we've already done, any of the activities we're already done, or uh, a game from last year or uh, something else, um, it would be one of those, like, um, they, get, they get to choose from that sort of uh, set of options for rewards. I would never be like, it's free to do whatever you want, because then that's like crazy and there's no structure and they, you know, who knows what they would choose. But I would say like, here are your like top five options. And in those things, I'd maybe have like previous games, previous books we've read, um, maybe tech games, if you have that as part of your classroom, maybe a music video that they have seen or maybe haven't seen, um, you know, something that you would think would be fun to expand for them. Um, so that I think that you could absolutely have this in acti like an activity day, but I just don't currently do that. Um, okay, cool. Oh, sorry, so uh, I have a prop this week. So I, I'm thinking like, oh, hey, we're just chit chatting about <laughs> content. So I have my bubbly water. Although if you're at home with wine or something else, you know what, you do you, but I'm, um, I'm enjoying this blackberry citrus seltzer okay so um next question Lindsay says uh movement i really enjoy doing movement activities with my students this year they seem to really struggle with them 
There are some that just don't want to, others that think they're too cool, and so many who can't follow the directions or listen to personal space. I found it more difficult this year than ever before with all of my age groups. Yes. Um, okay, so how do you get kids who are struggling or who just don't want to participate or are too cool, how do you get them to do more movement activities? Um, that is a great question. I think it, you have to sort of trick them. As with all good... <laughs> activities um you have to trick students into doing what you want them to do or uh coerce them um so anyway so <laughs> uh but i mean like all all teaching is um you know rewards and benefits and how do you get students motivated and engaged and sometimes that's a classroom management thing sometimes that's a student management thing sometimes that's behavior sometimes that's the content it all depends um, so if, if it's movement based and they're not like super jazzed, one of the things I like to do is use videos. So whether that's like um, a video where like it's like a brain break sort of a thing where they match what's happening on the screen. Um, you can find a lot of really cool interactive videos where it's like, oh, they're racing and running. They got to jump over the rock or whatever. So like it's movement um, that starts with like a challenge. Um, you could also that that could morph into the movement it can be like a creative movement challenge where then like you provide some sort of challenge or thing. Like if I hit the wood block, you got to jump or if I hit whatever, you know, so you can sort of take those ideas and morph them into whatever lesson it is you're teaching that week. Um, I also think having videos of people dancing is really powerful. So um, videos where kids are dancing, videos where adults are dancing, videos um, that show different kinds of dance, ballet, hip hop, um, you know, contemporary, whatever to, to show kids what, moving can look like, um, especially if you um, are like me and you like K-pop, you know, like there's so many cool, like bands that look so cool doing amazing dance moves. And so you can find great examples of people who the kids think are cool, who are then also moving. And then that inspires them hopefully to, um, to do more movement. But videos are really helpful, whether it's just like a brain break where they're matching what's happening on the screen or like example videos. Um, you can also trick them by using props. So scarves, ribbon wands, things like that, where they're more focused on the thing in their hand, but then you give them something to do with that um, thing. Uh, so like a ribbon wand or a scarf or a movement. And then what you could do is then also trick them again into... <laughs> I keep saying, but like you can trick them into to putting the prop down. So be like, okay, great. You did the movement with the scarf. That's the A. That's the A section of our song. There's a B section. Here's what you got to do. You got to put that prop down and you have to move like a squirrel around the room and choose a new scarf or whatever. Whatever your activity is, you can have an A section where it's with the prop, B section without. And so then they still have to do movement or something that matches, again, your curricular goals, but then they can be with props without. But the props help them feel less in their heads about the movement um, in, in some cases. It, you shouldn't rely on props, but in some cases, props are helpful. So the scarves, the ribbon wands, the bean bags, the whatever. Um, and then I would also say just use your winningest lessons, like the lessons that always go over really well. Um, consider using them. Maybe you taught one last year to this class. Bring it back modify it, add on, or just let them do it again. You know, if there's something you know that's movement-based that you think that they're going to like, uh, bring that back and let them try try that again. Um, okay, before I move on, let me check comments. Okay, going back to reward system. Uh, Nana says, I don't do a reward system either, but I'm in the minority. Would love to hear your reasoning as well. My school doesn't have a ton of behavior issues, like class-wide. Um, so I am fortunate enough that I don't have to implement a, a class-wide behavior system. Um, also, I have 30-minute classes, and I see them twice a week. So I build that relationship a lot more because I see them more frequently. Um, if it was less frequent or if it was, you know, if the situation were different, I probably would. I have in the past um, done sort of a reward system. Um, it's just a lot to keep track of, and it's a lot to work through. You just have to find what works well for you. But um, at my school, I'm fortunate not to have to do that. I do do like a musician of the day, like a winner of the day. So there is, there is some like monitoring of behaviors for that reason. But I don't have like a, our class wins and we get a party or whatever. I, I don't really quite do that. Um, 
Tiffany on Facebook says, do you have a cl re class reward for behavior? What do you do with a talkative class? So just, I don't really have a class reward, but I do reward like one or two kids. And then in the moment, you can also reward in the moment. It doesn't have to be like a class-wide thing, but like, hey, I'm if your class does dojo points, I'm giving out dojo points to X, Y, and Z because, or, ooh, oh my gosh, I have stickers for kids who are sitting so quietly crisscross applesauce. Here we go. You know, and, and so like you can reward on a smaller level, and I sort of talk, I'm going to hopefully talk about this a little bit later, but not have to do that full class reward thing. It, again, it depends on you, what you're comfortable with, and what your school does. If you're a PBIS school, and if you are a PBIS school, you know what PBIS school means. And if you're not a PBIS school, just ignore this. But if you're a PBIS school, I know that you probably have some sort of school-wide school -wide reward system that you can hook into. So if it's tickets or points or whatever, um, if your whole school is doing it, do it. But it, you know, again, it depends on you and your classroom and what you're most comfortable with. Okay, cool. Let's go on. Um, next question. Pre-K, have you taught it before? Any recommendations? I have taught it before. No recommendations. Next question. No. <laughs> um, I have taught it before. It's been a long time. Um, my recommendations are lots of exploring, lots of singing, lots of moving, lots of short activities. Um, don't try and keep their attention for too long because they can't, they can't keep their attention for too long. Um, when you say pre-K, it depends on how far pre-K we're talking. Um, but again, just smaller activities, shorter activities, lots of movement, lots of singing, lots of fun, fun, um, lots of exploring, all of that is good. Um, you can, again, videos help, uh, recordings help. Don't feel like you have to sing the whole time. You don't. Um, use recordings, videos that you think are really beneficial and add those in. If you want a great example or a place to find resources, go check out Lynn Kleiner. Um, if you know Lynn Kleiner, great. If you don't, um, she's the um, sort of the brain behind Music Rhapsody, which you can find online, musicrhapsody.com. And then she has a Facebook page. But she's done so much work with pre-K um, and has really, really great books. And, and her recordings are super stellar. So go check that out. She also does like an online training and an in-person training. I think she still does the online one. I don't know. COVID has changed how people do trainings. But she does a training too if you're interested. Um, it, lots with puppets. Um, and she, she's the person who got me started on puppets. So if that says anything about how much I value her <laughs> resources, that probably says a lot. But um, check out Lynn Kleiner Music Rhapsody. Otherwise, just, you know, load up your lessons with lots of fun, shorter activities. Okay, let's see. Alexandria says, how do you handle music center task cards for students who aren't strong readers? Most of my students learn in the second language and I love to make task cards in French, but I don't know if their reading would allow the centers to be successful. That is an interesting question. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, how do you handle music ta center task cards for students who aren't strong readers? Okay, so there are a couple questions. If they're not strong readers or if they're not functioning in your class in their primary language. Those are not necessarily the same thing because you can have kids who are not very good readers who English is their first language and you can have kids who are not very good readers in English where French is their first language or, or vice versa English French or Spanish or whatever. Um, so that's sort of two different questions. So I would say one thing is it no matter if, whether they're English language learners or whether they're um, in their home language. Um, if there's a student who doesn't read well um, Instead of having a written out example of what happens in the task center, have a video. Um, if you can have a short little video on an iPad or a QR code that they take around their iPad or whatever that shows how the game works, that's really beneficial. Um, or if you can show in class, like to the whole class, here's how the center works, that's really beneficial. Or what's really helpful is if you do this as a, a whole class activity, like if it's a, a rhythm composition center or a whatever you're doing center, um, rhythm composition is an example. If you do that as a whole class activity, maybe with small groups, then you can take that activity and put it in a center. They've already tried it before. It just gives them more exposure with that activity and more of a chance to try out the material, but it means that they are not learning anything new. They are just retrying that activity they have already previously explored. So that's one thing. Either give a video, give a demo, or have done it before. The other thing I would say um, is you sort of have to be picky about what you put in centers if you think a language barrier or reading is a barrier for them. Um, don't have long, complicated 
um, written examples, maybe have an audio recording or a video again to demo or give them more feedback, um, or pair them off with kids who can read better or, um, you know, just trying to take away that function or just have the game be really intuitive. If you if you have a game that like is based off of something else they've done before, um, if it like has picture examples, um, that can be really helpful too. So if you don't have a video, you can have a picture that goes like, you know, this this star goes here or whatever. You know, you can, it, it depends on what the activity is. So it's hard for me to answer this without like saying like in this specific example, but um, any sort of visual that you think would sort of surpass that language barrier is going to be helpful. I, I try I try not to put any, that's not true. I try to, to put as many written examples in center directions because that is a barrier for a lot of kids. And or they just don't read them. They're just so excited about the center, they ignore the written example and just barrel through the activity. So uh, I, that's what, again why I think a video is really helpful or a demo or if you've tried it before, that's really really helpful for kids. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump because there's another question about centers. And um, I want, since we're talking about centers. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, so th this other question from Renee, how often do you do stations or centers? And then Michelle says, and how would you make sure each student gets to all the different centers? Great question. The answer again is, uh, it depends. <laughs> I feel, like, I feel like with all these questions, I can be like, ooh, great question. I don't know. It depends. Next question. You know, like, because so much of these questions, so many of these questions and so much of this content is specific to what you do in your classroom. Like, d d it depends on how you've taught them, what you've taught them, how they learn, how they work together. So I will give you an answer, but it is, uh, it, it depends. It, you may not implement it the same way I do. Um, lately, I've been doing less centers. Um, in a normal year, a non-COVID touched year, um, I would probably do more, but it depends on the year. It depends on program, expectate, like concert expectations. Um, at the beginning of the year, we were doing like less sharing of materials, less, you know, everything in masks. And so, so it's like that messed a lot of things up. Um, in the next year, I assume, like next school year, I would assume that I would probably do centers maybe once a quarter um, for a couple lessons at a time. Um, and the thought is like, if we've done several games or things together in class, I can put those in centers so that not all of the centers are learning new material or trying something new. It's like, you're taking this thing we've already done, you're sort of redoing it or rehashing it again in your small center. But again, it depends on the grade level. It depends on their ability to work independently. So with younger kids, I'd probably be doing less. You know, um, with older kids, we could maybe do more. It just depends on your kids, how often you see them, what you're asking them to do, and all that sort of thing. Um, like for me, record when I do recorders, I try and build in center time so that then I can work with kids who are struggling. We can do shorter, shorter smaller activities in centers and rotate, and then they can get some different experience. But that's something that would slant older because recorders are generally an older kid thing anyway. But um, how, how you do it depends on what curriculum you're teaching. So I'm sorry, there's not like a really clear answer with that. Um, but however, Michelle, your question, how would you make sure each student gets to all the different centers? Okay, so let's say you break up your class. Um, let's say you break up so that you have eight small groups. Right, so like eight groups of three, eight groups of four, or whatever, however many kids. And I would say in a in a in a group that rotates, you should have three to four kids in a group. Anything less than three gets awkward. Anything more than four gets rowdy. So if you can have three or four in a group, to me that's the sweet spot. Okay, so it let's say you have eight different rotating groups of four kids. That's what thirty two kids, right? So that tops out a lot of where we're at for our class. Um, numbers, but maybe you have five or whatever, you know, it depends on you and your school. Um, so anyway, if you have three or four kids in a group, you have eight different centers, let's say you could do eight different activities, right? But if you do that, then you need to plan at least however much time you have in your class divided by eight. So if you have only 30 minutes in your class and you have to get them in and get them out, 
let's say that that eats up two or three minutes at the beginning of class. If you try and explain anything, it eats up some time. You might end up with only two or three minutes at each center, and that's not a lot of time. By the time they rotate, by the time they get there and sit down and pull out the stuff, it's like there's no time. So I try not to do eight completely different centers in a rotation. Instead, I have four activities that show up at two centers. So like, let's say there's a ukulele activity. I would put that in center one and center five. If there's a reading activity, I'd put that in center two and center six. If there's a composition activity, I'd put that in center three and center seven. If there's a video activity, I'd put that in center four and center eight. So that really, they can come through, we can spread out into eight groups at, at eight centers, but the content, they are only getting four centers worth of content. So if you, if you take your time at center one and then you rotate to center two, cool, new activity, center three, cool, new activity, rotate to center four, cool, new activity. If you have time to rotate to center five, you're getting what you got at center one. So like that means that you kids can spend more time at a center that they can actually interface with the activity and like actually work through it a little bit more. You can you're not wasting them time. And then also you're not you the teacher are not trying to find content as much to put in centers because really you're only coming up with four activities and you make two copies of that activity, right? But you're you're spending less time looking for stuff because you have less stuff to deal with if that makes sense i hope that makes sense that's just sort of my cheat way of like yes you're rotating through but then it's not like well we didn't get through all eight centers so i gotta like write down where we stopped so we know where to go next time it's just like a quick way to like get them through all the content um in in the right amount of time okay going back um great next question <laughs> I hope that if that didn't answer your question please put that in the comments i'll try and get back to that um Kimberly says, do you use your previous lesson plans for the following year when you do long range planning? How do you long range plan without getting overwhelmed? How do you map out your school year? Okay, do I use my previous lessons? Yes, if they were good. <laughs> but sometimes they weren't. And so when I go through all my lesson plans, and I try and be real honest with myself because I'm the only one reading these plans, like no one else is reading these plans, except maybe my principal, I don't know. So when I teach a lesson, um, I'll write like, great or I'll like modified or change like I never leave my lesson plan as I planned it after I teach the lesson I go back and I'm like well that didn't you know like I'll, I'll rewrite like used a video here or this took a long time or had to bump this to day two or whatever so I know like okay the timing was different or something else worked or I don't want to forget that I had this video from YouTube or whatever um so that I'm not spending time trying to decipher so like after the lesson is taught I go back and annotate my own lesson plans so then yes I use those as a guide for the following year but maybe a lot has to change maybe instead of teaching um barnyard songs I'm teaching ocean songs because I know that the concert is going to be based around the ocean or whatever instead or so some of the content might change but um generally the bigger structures stay there and and there are some songs I teach every year you know, like this is a first grade song to me, I use it every year in first grade. Or this is a third grade song, I use it every year in third. So some of those things, yes, they're in that long range planning. Um, and I use that to sort of plan for the following year. So before I move to your next question, also, when I lesson plan, I have like my like r longer written out lesson plans that have the sort of structure for each lesson. And then on the side, and I'll put this on the links page, I have, I call it my song and poem map. So, and I just write in like January and I write down like the songs in purple and the poems in green and the books I read in blue. So then I can, instead of like having to like flip through each actual like long lesson, I can just be like, Ooh, did this song in January. It's Cause then the longer version is like, for me, I might put like the song name and then I might put like the process of like, did the poem first, added the book, added instruments or whatever, just so I know like my process of how I got through it. Um, but but in the on the map, I might just put the name of the song, if that makes sense. So that's that's easier for me when I'm planning, doing long range planning. I can look at that map from the previous year and go, oh, I did this song and this song in February and this song in March. OK, so that I, uh, helps me sort of structure. And then if I'm if I want to pull that exact lesson, I can go back and find that lesson and pull out sort of the structure of like how I did that. But um, anyway, that's sort of how I long range plan. OK, and then how do you plan without getting overwhelmed? How do you map out your school year? 
that is an easy question or an easy answer for me because I have a scope and sequence in my school district. Like we have, um, my school district has a set plan of like, these are all the things that we try and learn in second grade. Um, these are the, the skills we hit in first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter. And so having a scope and sequence helps me know like, well, you know, I can teach this song anytime I want, but if I'm going to be referencing blah, 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 I'm doing that in the second quarter. I'm doing that in the first quarter or whatever. So that sort of definitely helps me out. So my recommendation to you, if you don't have a curriculum or a scope and sequence, is email all your friends um, and say, hey, who's got a scope and sequence? <laughs> or can I use it as a guide? Or you know, A couple of years ago, I was at a district that didn't have one. And so it was like, hey, friends, who does have something like this? Uh, we're trying to make our own for our own district, and we'd love some examples. Because maybe someone sends you the years, and you're like, I would never do this this way. Or I don't. they're doing this in first grade. I would do this in fourth grade or I don't know, whatever. Because we're all sort of in different situations. But you can use that scope and sequence to guide you as you're doing your lesson planning. So if you don't have one, ask your friends. Hey, or ask in a Facebook group. Hey, maybe even the Facebook group I suggested at the beginning of this video. Every moment matters. Music education community. Go join and ask, hey, does somebody have a scope and sequence they'd love to share? Because I'm trying to build one for my school district and we'd love to see your example, yada, yada, yada. But use, I would say use that example as you're going to sort of help guide you in, in what you do. Okay, I'm taking a, a break for my my bubbly water, my seltzer water. This is, okay, this is just Kroger brand, but it's like the best one I've had. I mean, you can you can get fancy, and I have a soda stream, but this Blackberry Citrus is a winner. If I could recreate this with a soda stream, I'd be amazing. If you have the recipe for this, please email me. Okay, next question. Uh, Brittany says, do you have any units that you absolutely cover in each grade level, like Peter and the Wolf for first grade, etc.? And then Janelle followed up, what is important for students to know each year? What are the highlights, critical lessons for each grade? This is a great piggyback question to the previous question. What is in your scope and sequence? <laughs> um, so I would say uh, there are a couple things that, yes, I do specifically every year. Peter and the Wolf, I do it in first grade every year. I just, I don't know, it feels right to me. Um, it's the, it, kids love it. It's a great time. Um, or Carnival of the Animals. I never teach it, but I put it in my second grade sub plans every year. So like, I know they're getting it. Um, or Ukulele in fifth, the recorder in fourth. Or like, I, I know that there are things I'm going to do every time, but a lot of that is driven by the scope and sequence. So as you're crafting your own district scope and sequence, think like, where would this fit in? Where would Peter and the Wolf fit in? Do I want to do Hall of the Mountain King? No. In 11 years, I've never taught that. Like, I've, ne I've never taught. I don't know why. I, I just, like, there are things I'm like, that'd be cool, but then it just never quite fits in. But, like, if, if you're like, mm, I want to do Hall of the Mountain King, figure out where it's going to go in the scope and sequence and, like, pencil it in. So then as you're planning, you can sort of hit some of the things as you go. But are there things I absolutely cover in each grade level? Eh, yeah, usually. So, I, I, for me, I try and structure a couple. The, the couple things that help me structure as I'm thinking about bigger planning is um, note value and rhythmic notation, ry rhythm reading, note reading. So, like, when is it appropriate to learn about sixteenth notes? When is it appropriate to learn about half notes, dotted notes, those sorts of things? That is like a big structure that I think about for the six year from K through five. So that structures out right. And, and I think like well, we're using mostly quarter notes and eighth notes in kindergarten, blah, 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 blah. You know, like that, that's easy to figure out. Then figuring out like what kind of solfege am I using? When am I using that? How, you know, what what are this, the melodic patterns that I'm trying to hit? Those That's another thing that's, that sequences through um, all the years. But then after that, it's like, well, do they really need to know about this, you know, form? Or do they need to know about, you know, how do I stretch their vocal range? Like what sort of songs am I trying to hit? Um, so sometimes I'll put in some of those songs like this is a really great song for this grade because it stretches their vocal range. So sometimes I'll pencil those in in certain grades based on the value of the song. But I, again, it all piggybacks off that scope and sequence. So if you don't have one, you should get one. Ask a friend if they've got one because that really does help. Okay, Nikki says, I almost always curious about a movement sequence, both creative and folk dance. Um, I feel like I could grow in this area. So many students can better build their skills from first to fourth. Okay, this is another great curriculum over time question. And my answer to this is take your ORF levels because 
um, in ORF levels. If you're not familiar with ORF training, um, uh, so ORF Schulwerk, the training where you basically learn how to teach music in this specific sort of way. Uh, part of it is just straight pedagogy and like uh, basic pedagogy for your classroom. Then you get an intensive um, class every day on recorder and an, an intensive class every day on movement. And in that movement class, um, you learn about all the basics of movement, all the things that you need to know, all sort of the, the vocabulary attendance and things that like you should, you could use uh, to teach your movement lessons. And then one of my assignments in ORF level two was to structure a scope and sequence for movement, for just movement specific concepts. And so in that class, it's like we already knew all the concepts we were gonna do. We thought about where they would go in the scope and sequence. It really helped us plan out like, well, we shouldn't do this until this grade because we have to do this first. And so it, that really was a great catalyst to helping me understand what was important and most important, and then also to think about where it would go. Um, Yes. Okay. And then also, I'm just going to say to all this curriculum stuff, um, I think a great scope and sequence is so helpful, but I don't know a teacher who's like, I get it all every year. I get everything. I cover every concept with the breadth that I would like every single year. I do it. No, I don't know any teacher who does that. Classroom teacher, music teacher, PE teacher. I don't know a single person who's like, I get everything on the pacing guide every year. Um, because I think that those pacing guides and curriculum goals are made for like a best case scenario school year and they don't take into account field trips, snow days, uh, concerts, uh, your, you know, librarian comes to you and says, hey, this is our book of the year. Can you incorporate this somehow? You know, like there are all these other factors that come into play. And those scope and sequence things are like best case scenario. If you can get to as much of this as you can, that's great. But it doesn't, doesn't mean it's going to happen. So give yourself a little grace if you're like, oh, man, I was going to talk about, I don't know, dotted eighth and sixteenth rest. I don't know, some some specific thing, but you, you may not get to it. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, uh, so I'm going to jump a little bit. Let's see. Um, Robin says, virtual classes that would be helpful for elementary music. Well, I've got this online ukulele course that I did. <laughs> so, okay, this is a shameless plug. I I, I like te teaching ukulele. This year I developed a course, a curriculum, where or not a curriculum, a, a, an online course. It's like a four and a half hour course, all online, where you can go anytime you want um, and learn about like how to integrate ukulele into your own classroom. Where can you find it? Courses.makemomentsmatter.org um, and or find the links page and it gives you great value information you can learn on your own at home on your own time. Okay, so if, commercial over. So uh, where actually would your um, dollars be best spent? I think you should join the American ORF Schulwerk Association. So AOSA, it's the National Umbrella Organization. If you're, if there's a local ORF chapter near you where you can like go to workshops and stuff, there are a lot of people who will go to those workshops but never join the national organization. But here's why you should. Because um, if you're a national member, um, there are all these cool perks and benefits. You get the published, the, there's like a journal that's published uh, quarterly that you get. Um, you get the emails and the information from the organization. They have weekly, like uh, they call them reverberations, which are like uh, teaching ideas and teaching things. You get all the stuff on the member side. But one of the best, coolest things is that on um, the AOSA website, um, they have hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of videos from our national conference, from local workshops, from um, people who helped develop Orschel work and, and the American version and, and the international stuff. So like there's so much content there and from like these am amazing brain, brilliant, amazing brains. Um, so if you joined the national organization just to get that video library content, it would be worth it. But then there's also like, I'm part of the national organization. You can find mentors there and you can get, I mean, there's so much you can get from joining the national organization, but that, that video library, just all by itself is totally worth the whatever the national membership is. Even if you think like, I'm buying all this content for this amount of money, it's, it's worth it. So go check that out. Join AOSA at AOSA.org. Um, 
for more than just the videos, but the videos are really helpful too, so go check that out. Oh, Brett says, I'd like to know about family folk dance nights. Well, guess what? I did a whole video about that on uh, week four, January 31st. So <laughs> I'm not going to, uh, I only have 20 more minutes, so I'm not going to go back to that. But there's a whole video about that. And um, I talked about it in a previous year as well. So, you know, oh, this is uh, the 15th video of spring 2022. However, there are 120 Musical Mondays videos Oh, that's so also okay. Sorry, previous question. Virtual classes. Guess what? Go back to the Musical Mondays archives. Hey, it's free on YouTube and Facebook um, in the archives. But anyway, no, um, you can't. You, I, I talked about it last year. I also talked about it this year. Um, family Folk Dance Night. If you have a specific question, shoot me that one. But um, I'm going to zoom ahead. Ter uh I think Taryn says, what sub lessons would you suggest for a non-musical sub that doesn't require technology and would be easy to follow for both upper and lower grades? Okay, the, um, okay, so a couple thoughts there. Uh, non-music sub doesn't require technology. So I, I am of the same mindset of like, I'm trying to make them do less. So with a sub, I try and give them several examples. I give them a book that they can read. I give them coloring pages. I give them this is younger book they can read, coloring pages, some sort of online activity if they're willing to jump there, some sort of video if that's what they want to do. Some so I, I try and give like, here are the five things you can do because you never know if a sub is like, I am a para for kindergarten and I got pulled into this. Or if they're like, I am a seven year veteran of, or a 40 year veteran, you know, like who knows what they, what experience they have. Maybe they've been teaching music for 40 years and they just retired and they want to jump back in. Well, then don't use my stupid video lesson. Use whatever you want to do. You know, so like I like giving them options. Um, but for some people, it's like no technology, non-music sub. Then I would do one of two things. Um, I came up with a set of resources in the last year or so called Book Companion. It's on my Teachers Pay Teachers page. But basically you get a, a book. Um, okay, I have none of them handy. None of them nearby. Um, Nope, that's not one of them. Anyway, so there are a bunch of, there are eight different books that I have, almost all about musical uh, composers or musicians or performers. And basically you read the book and then there's a set of worksheets or follow-up questions. There's video links. There's all sorts of stuff. So that's that was my answer to that question of like, what do I do with a sub for multiple grades, upper or lower? So there's some books like uh, Before John Was a Jazz Giant about John Coltrane that sort of just slants lower, K-1-2. And then some books like uh, my name is Celia or Drum Dream Girl or whatever that would maybe slant towards um, three, four, five. And so um, I try and um, put those out for subs so that they have something to work on. But I, I know if you don't want to go and buy that or whatever, that's that's totally fine. That's just like my example because I knew this book would be really helpful. Um, and then giving them options. Do you want to show a video? Do you want to do the worksheets? Do you want to do a coloring page? Like I give all of that to the sub. Um but I would also say if you have a textbook series, look through, uh, pull out lessons that you think that they could handle, maybe a poetry lesson, maybe a history lesson, um, a context, musical context or music throughout the world or something. Um, or maybe your curriculum has like a sub book. Some of those music textbook series have like a book that's like specifically for music subs. And guess what? If your district bought it, you can leave it for the sub and let them figure it out. Because if the district was like, this is good curriculum. Cool. Well, you hired the sub too. So here's the thing. I mean, you know, don't like leave the sub, sub out, you know, like out to dry or whatever. But like, if that's a resource the district thought was great, then use that. You know, don't, don't, you know, kill yourself trying to, to um, figure out what you can give a sub because you never know what they're going to do. Um, okay, let's see. Um, oh, this is a great question. Holly says, what do you do with fifth graders who are so ready for middle school? I kick them to the curb and wave goodbye. No, that's not what I do. Okay, Rose followed up. I agree with this. Only for our elementary school, it goes to sixth grade, and it's a huge struggle figuring out what will appeal to them. Who knows? You know, when, when they've hit senioritis and they're like, I'm done with this school, um, it's like... It's, it's hard to know what is going to appeal to them. So I try a lot of different things. Um, I try and meet them where they're at as much as possible. And I try and keep them active. So uh, my fifth graders respond really well to doing the ukulele unit at the end of the school year. 
So that's what we're doing. Um, it pushes them. It's something new. They try new things. So that's cool. Um, for some kids, they like games, um, you know, musical games, uh, uh, musical content through games, things like that. Uh, maybe you use a video to entice them or projects. I've also done a thing where it's like a composition project or a composer's project or um, what you could do is you could say like, okay, each small group gets to research one performer and that's, you know, do, you would want to give parameters and things. And then maybe we have a, uh, like a March Madness sort of a defend your, um, everybody's going to present and then we'll decide who is the best performer, whatever that we've pulled out, you know? So like you could have like projects, things like that, where kids get a little bit more freedom or more chance to be expressive or have fun. And then, but still focused on the content. Um, okay. I wrote something, but I definitely cannot read it. Oh, 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 okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good job, David, but improve your writing. Okay, so I said a lot of fifth graders, even though like, oh, we're so cool. They love if you're like, hey, you remember this game from second grade? Should we try that again? You can take old content because some of them are like, oh, we're being nostalgic because we're about to leave elementary school. And so you can like pull in a game or a, a thing that they've done before. And then maybe this time you're like, hey, we're going to add instruments this time. Or look, we're going to play it as is, but I'm going to make it, I'm going to add a second level to it or whatever. Like with that stick game, guess what? You didn't know there's an elimination part to it or whatever. Um, you can take old content that you know that they liked before and then repurpose that for new lessons, maybe add new things in. But it there is no right answer. Some kids are just going to be negative, sour pusses, and you can't, there's only so much you can do. Oh, another thing I like to do with, with older grades is I like to do like a musician of the day or like a, a composer of the day or a performer of the day where um, you like spend, you know, five minutes talking about, um, you know, I don't know, Stevie Wonder and talk about his career, talk about his thing and then show a couple of video examples. Um, they love that, you know, where you're like, oh, and you're going to give a little bit and you're like, oh, you know, just talk through that person, tell why they're cool and then show a couple examples. So maybe one day you do like Stevie Wonder and then maybe the next day you do like um, J-Lo and then the next day you do like K-pop and then, you know, BTS and the next day you do like uh, yeah, something completely different. George Gershwin or whatever you just I, I like to I did that last year and it was really fun and so like they get to see lots of different examples of things and you could talk about why it's cool for different reasons you know like oh here's a really cool thing that this person did or oh my gosh she was a pioneer of x y and z and this is so cool and maybe you know like so it it, it again is like more contextual for them because it's like this is like cool music that you might hear on the radio it's not like an Orf xylophone song. It's a cool thing or what, you know, like, so you can use that music history and context to like draw them in a little bit more. But again, who knows with fifth graders slash sixth graders, they're wild. So, you know, who knows? Um, okay. Let's see. Um, let's see. I think that all teachers have seen more challenging behaviors this year. Okay. This is a great segue. Do you have a favorite classroom management strategy? Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, my favorite strategy is find a kid who's doing something good and just like reward the heck out of them. So uh, positive behavior, right? So like positive rewards. So like uh, maybe you get a sticker. Maybe you get uh, to go pop one of the bubbles. Maybe you get to sit in the cool chair. Maybe, you know, you get a pass out of this activity or I don't know, whatever it is that you want to do. Find those great kids and reward, reward, reward. That's like my go-to thing to do. Um and then it's like some kids are like, well, what do I need to do to get the reward? Oh, well, let me just tell you. But I think that the more you can do that, the less that it's like a negative, like you did this, so you got to go sit out or whatever. It's It puts the focus on the positive thing. And especially this time of year, like they want to earn a reward or maybe their classroom's giving out tickets for whatever. And so you can, you know, like this is the time to like amp up those rewards that maybe you've been sitting on all year. This is the time to do that. Or maybe you give out a really cool reward to one kid who does super do. You know, I don't know. That's that's generally my go-to thing for kids, um, like class-wide. Um, if there's a, a specific kid with a specific behavior, then that is a little trickier because then that's like a contextual thing that you can only really handle um, based on that kid. And part of it is you got to develop a relationship with them. Um, I would say always try and do like a, a private versus public. So like 
uh, if they're doing something wrong, talk to them individually instead of calling them out in front of the class. That's a, that's a good, you know, um, a good specific thing for a specific situation sort of a thing. But it again, it just depends on what it is that's happening. Why is it happening? Um, you sort of have to find the reason behind the thing before you can fix it. So in general, I try and be real positive with rewards through my whole class with all kids. Um, and then if there are specific situations, I try and pinpoint what that is and why and then handle that from there. Okay, a couple people talked about um, neurodivergent. So here are a couple questions. Um, any suggestions for teaching special learners on the autism spectrum and coral warm-ups would be greatly appreciated. Okay, I'm going to skip the coral warm-ups real quick. Um, autism spectrum. It depends. Be not just on the student, but on the student, on the day, on the activity. I mean, so much of their reaction or so much of them responding um, or what we would maybe perceive as like a behavior or an outward thing is their response to a stimuli or their response to something that's happened. So the first thing I would say is to you, just be a good listener and learner as you're interacting with that student and try and figure out maybe the reasoning behind a behavior or reasoning behind a thing or reasoning behind a reaction even. Maybe it's not even like a negative behavior or something that's, you know, but just like, why did they react that way? Just try and see if you can figure out why that is. Um, and then that sort of guides what you do next. The reason this is so tricky is if you have one student in your class that you know has been identified on the autism spectrum, that's different than if you have a class of eight students by themselves on the autism spectrum, or if you have a class of six kids who push in with another homeroom or something. I mean, everyone's situation is different. And I have been in all those situations where I have an entire class full of third graders and one kid has been identified on the autism spectrum. How do you differentiate for that? And then I've also had a thing where it's just eight, only eight kids in a self-contained classroom that's all just specifically autism spectrum. Well, I'm gonna do absolutely different activities with them than I would if I had like 30 kids in a different sort of situation. I've also had where like I have like 30 kids and then they push in that group of eight kids on top. And so I have 38 kids. So. It, it's just a balancing act. You sort of have to figure out what's right for you and what's right for the situation of the kids. In general, I would say visual cues are really helpful. Um, adapt the this what you do for what students can handle. Students in general, students on the autism spectrum, people on the autism spectrum, um, are really affected by stimulus. So for some kid, for some kids, for some people. Um, sounds, certain sounds can really trigger things or, or, or be overstimulating. So you just have to learn what those things are. There was one time where I had a class where um, egg shakers, there was one kid who just could not, could not do it um, to the point where I did use them in one lesson. He was turned off from music for the rest of the year. He was like over it, can't do that. And so I had to talk with him and his parents and whatever and be like, we're not using egg shakers again, you know, or we're, you know, so it's finding out what those stimulus things are and then adapting. Um, but yeah, so sl slow down, use visual cues, um, think about the stimulus, try and figure out if there are things that are overstimulating or not, Let's figure out how you're going to change that. Uh, and then more hands-on if possible. Um, and then just, you know, adapt, see, learn, watch in the moment and see what you learn from those kids as you're learning together. Okay, so here's another question that's similar. What are your suggestions when dealing with pre-K students that are overstimulated at all times? Okay, that is crazy <laughs> at all times. Um, so I, for that, I would say for pre-K, if they're overstimulated at all times, my go-to for pre-K is just to amp up my energy and use lots of smaller um, games, lots of smaller examples that are high energy and exciting. And maybe I use a puppet and then we sing a song, then we do a game, then we move. Like that's my pre-K strategy or kindergarten strategy or what, you know, um, more activities, shorter amount of time, more energy. If your class is overstimulated at all times or just bouncing off the wall or maybe you're having a management issue, then I, then I do the opposite. And instead, I'm, I try to be like a calm little cucumber and I play like a gentle thing on the ukulele when they walk in. We make our circle, we sit down, we do calm activities. It's fun. Maybe then we have a beanie baby. We have to slowly move around the room or whatever. Just the energy level changes. 
maybe I lower the lights. Maybe we do an activity that's, uh, we have a movement thing based on a video. Maybe, you know, but lower the level of activity and then so you're stimulating them less. You can still do short activities. You can still do more singing. Just change how you're doing that and how you're presenting that to them. And that might make things more successful. It also depends on your lesson structure. Um, I would say if they're overstimulated at all times, then every single lesson would look the same. You come in, we sing, we do a circle. We do a small circle game. Then we move to our spots. Then we watch a little video. After that video, I'm going to be playing my ukulele. And you're going to come over and sit at the book spot. And I read them. But every single lesson will look the same so they know they can predict what is going to happen. Again, for a lot of kids, especially kids who are, um, have special ed accommodations or on the autism spectrum or whatever, they like structure. If you can give them the lesson structure and say, first this happens, then this happens, then this happens, that is just so helpful for them. So maybe if your class is overstimulated, then you think like, okay, I've got to have the same structure for all my lessons. I can vary things in that structure, but in general, um, I'm going to keep sort of the same format. That's really helpful for a lot of kids, especially if they're overstimulated. Okay, I think I have time for one more question. That's a really big question. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to go back to this one. Um, Helping students finding their singing voices. See, I said I was going to choose a question that wasn't a big question. That's a big question. Um, model. Lots of modeling. I model. I have other students model. I find video models. I find video examples. I try and find lots of people who are modeling. We play lots of games. I focus less on solo singing than um, large groups singing together. Um, lots of playing, moving, doing together. Um, but a lot of games, a lot of models, a lot of examples, a lot of trying before I ever try and single the student out or before I ever try to ask them to do it on their own. Um, just lots and lots and lots of doing before I ask students to modify or change what they're doing. So I might say like a thing in the moment of like, ooh, here we go, bring your voice up here or whatever. But I'm not going to be like, you, child, you, you're not doing it right. Here's how we're going to fix it. Like I would... I wouldn't do that. I would be lots of trying, lots of modeling. And honestly, I, I don't, I used to stress out about whether they're using their singing voice. I, I until like the end of kindergarten, I don't even really, I, I just feel like they need lots of exposure, lots of trying, because I don't feel like they're singing at home as much. We are, we're always saying, I'm not singing like they used to. Well, people don't sing as much outside of school or whatever or at home. And so it's like, it, the more exposure and trial of that that I can give them, the better they're going to be. So lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of doing and modeling and singing. And, and hopefully that helps them. Okay, there have been some other questions that have come in. I think I've gotten many of them. Um, the one, Tiffany says, if there was one resource book that you would recommend, what would it be? Um, my favorite book of all time is this book here. It's called Elementaria. I learned about it when I did my ORF levels, my ORF training. It's written by Gunild Kateman, who was like Carl Orff, she was like the brains behind Orf Schulwerk. She was a huge part of what Orf Schulwerk became. Um, and, and it's a brilliant book. It's short. I mean, there's not a lot, but it's like chock full of pedagogy and great information, especially if you've taken Orf training. This is great to have. Even if you haven't, it's great to have. It is a book where like you read in their examples. I have lots of like things written and of like, wow, that's brilliant. Or um, notes and things so like this I think is the bestest book of all time this is not like a lesson book it's not a book where you're like oh I'm gonna take that idea and, and run with it um, for that I would say this is my favorite like lesson book of all time again ORF based this is by Jeff Kriske and Randy DeLellis um, as American as Apple Pie I think I've used every lesson in here at some point um, and and I think there are some really great things in there so those are my two favorites um, so much so that I have them right here by my desk. <laughs> um, and I use them all the time. So those I think are super great. Okay. If I didn't get your question tonight, I am so very sorry. Uh, I tried to get to as many as I could, but while still actually addressing that question. Um, but I have one request for you as this is the last Musical Mondays video of the school year. Um, if you would take two minutes, just two minutes, and do a quick questionnaire um, I promise it, it's not involved. You don't have to give me your social security number 
or any other identifying information. It is completely anonymous. Um, it, I'm not going to add you to an email list. I'm not going to spam you, nothing like that. But um, if you give me your feedback, it helps me know how to plan these Musical Mondays videos or what content is valuable um, or what you think. That's just really helpful. So no matter if you're watching, listening, you're doing it live or not, um, if you click the, the description for wherever it is you're watching or listening, you should be able to find the link to that. Or you can go to the links page and, and click the link there for just a quick, quick, quick survey. Anyway, thanks so much for coming on. This is my 30th video of the year, 15th for the spring. There are 120 Musical Mondays videos in the archive on YouTube and on Facebook that, and on my podcast that you can go back and access if you want. Um, thanks so much for coming along with me this year. It's been so much fun to share with everyone. Um, if you have a question or comment after these videos are over, find me at makemomentsmatter.org and you can email me at makemomentsmatter at gmail.com. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming along tonight. It's been great chatting, and I'll see you next fall. Bye, everyone.